Well, it's good to see so many folks here. I'm here to talk about pre-seed investing. Uh, the first question I normally get is, what the heck is pre-seed investing? And how does it differ from traditional seed investing? So my basic goal today is to just walk you through why I think pre-seed investing is interesting. Who in the room is fundraising for his or her own startup, doing it now, thinking about it? So I just want to give you uh, a sense of the landscape today and also leave plenty of room for questions because fundraising is super dynamic. And I think we're at a really unique time right now with what's happening with the public markets, the unicorns and all these things. It's really changing the way investors think about what it means to fund a pre-seed company. So quickly, I'll just tell you about me. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. I moved out here about 20 years ago for college, studied econ and Spanish. Uh, I've worked on and off <coughs> in venture my entire career. Spent about four years working for the CIA's venture capital group, InQtel. Worked at a handful of companies in the game space. Worked uh, actually in Redwood City, for those of you who are probably closer to my age, for a company called Excite at Home that's no longer with us that used to be on the other side of the, the 101 from here. And for the last five years, I was a partner at, at a VC firm called SoftTech VC. And just to kind of give you the arc of how we got to where we are today, back in 2004, it was really hard to raise that first round of capital that you needed to start a company. Most VCs back then wanted to give you $1 million for a quarter of your company, and you would take that little million dollars, and if they knew you and you were a well-referenced person, you might get a shot at starting a company. Or you could go to individual angels. But back in 2004, there were a handful of VC firms, SoftTech, Felicis, Floodgate, some of the firms that you know today, that all had the same kind of aha moment. And who was in the Valley in 2003, 2004? Just out of curiosity, who was, still, who was here then? It was an interesting time. We were coming out of the 2000s. There was this belief that maybe everything interesting on the internet had already been invented or started and that only crazy people were starting internet companies. And so there was this band of folks who said, we want to fund early stage entrepreneurs that are building companies where the cost of getting started is much lower. So this is the early days of kind of cloud computing and things that make it much less expensive to start companies. This was all going on. There were a handful of people who raised 25 and $30 million venture funds and jumped into the market, and they've all done really, really well for themselves because when they got started, there was nobody out there who really wanted to fund people from scratch. And it used to be that to get started, you needed millions of dollars because I think as Guy was talking about back in the day in his earlier presentation, you had to get you to buy servers and you had to find racks to put those servers in. You needed to sign a three-year lease with a big office building because there was no WeWork or co-working space. Getting started was actually a really expensive proposition. In the early 2000s, that changed. Now, as often ha happens, it's very rare that there's a chance within the venture capital business to disrupt the status quo. So those firms that all started in 2004, all started with relatively small funds. They were somewhere between five and $25 million. The nice thing about a really small venture capital fund is you can afford to write really small checks. So when you have a $25 million venture fund, you can write a 100 or 250K check to a promising entrepreneur because you think she's great and has a really good idea. You can be kind of flexible in terms of what you expect in terms of traction. And as an investor, you think about a, 20, a 250K check and say, well, out of a $25 million fund, not every check I have to write has to work out. I don't have to take a board seat in every case. You give yourself a lot of flexibility to run experiments and to bet on people who are unproven. And what happened is that model worked really well, and I think VCs are not immune to sort of some immutable laws. And one thing that happens in venture capital is if someone gives you $10 million, you do a really good job with it, people will flock and they will offer you more money. And typically what happens for most venture funds is you start out with a really small fund that's focused, that writes early checks, that's aggressive. You're successful. People say, hey, you did, that. You did so great with 10, how about 25? So you say, okay, 25, that's more money for me to play with, that's more management fees for me, that I can have a bigger organization, better office, more staff. So you go to 25, and you do well with the 25, people go, well, if 25 is good, how about 50? 50 sounds great. And at some point around 30 or $40 million, you realize the kind of investing that you're doing has changed. Because at 50 million bucks, you start asking yourself, gosh, if I write a 100K check, 
out of my fund. And if that 100K check goes to 20X, it's still only $2 million in returns for me. And I've got a $50 million fund that I'm trying to return. Gosh, I can't afford to write these little checks anymore. And why would I write a 100K check when I can find an entrepreneur who could digest a million dollars? Yeah, I want to write million dollar checks. And I want to take board seats. And I want to buy 8, 10, 20% of these companies. And very quickly, without realizing it, you can get to a place where the style of investing you're doing no longer matches what made you successful. And it's my belief that that's what's happening right now in the seed VC market. When I joined SoftTech five years ago, our typical check was in the 250 to 300K size. Those rounds were 750 to a million dollars, and believe it or not, only five years ago, a million and a half dollar seed round, that was considered really, really large. People just didn't do that. The thought was, if you needed a million and a half dollars for your seed round, it wasn't really a seed round. And what happened is, uh, that model worked really well. So that, uh, that enabled us to get into some really great companies, Postmates, Fitbit, a handful of them. Um, but there's this weird chicken and egg thing that happened in venture sometime uh, around 2011, where people started worrying about the Series A crunch, and seed VCs started saying, well, if I only give my companies a million dollars, and they get to a point where they can't be successful, I'm gonna have to bridge them. I don't wanna bridge them. What's the solution? I'll just increase the size of these seed rounds. So you saw seed rounds go from one and a half to $2 million. And the subtle shift that happened in the market is, I think a lot of investors say, I'd be willing to give that unproven, untested, first time entrepreneur, I'd be willing to give him or her 500K to see if they can get a prototype out the door, see if they can get some early traction, see if they're worthy of more capital. When you get to $2 million, in the world of early stage VC, that's real money. And there was a subtle shift that happened in the risk profile of the very firms that 10 years ago were kind of the avant-garde, really hard-charging folks who wrote small checks to early stage people. Their business models all changed. They said, we have 75 to $100 million funds. We want to invest in 40 or 50 companies. We want to have reserves to do subsequent rounds too. And next thing you know, they all want to write million dollar checks, they want to buy 10% of your company, they want board seats as part of those rounds. And it's perfectly rational. As a VC, you only have so much time and the bigger your fund gets, the natural tendency is to concentrate more of those dollars in a smaller number of companies. The weird thing that happened though is a lot of those firms stopped looking at what I think of as de novo companies. So when I think of as old seed investing is really strong team, maybe a really ugly, embarrassingly crappy prototype, a really good market, and some unique insight from the founders that can make you successful. And I just watched as all of the firms, including mine at SoftTech, just as we got bigger and bigger, we had less interest in being first money into these companies. So when I looked at the landscape, I said, there's so many VC firms I see across the board that are becoming more risk averse. They want to see more traction. They want more evidence. They want you to raise more money sooner, and they want you to make that money last longer. I said, what about the crazy people? The people who just want to get started, the people who have a really big, interesting idea, they don't want to raise $2 million. They want to raise 750 to a million because they want their team of three to four uh, employees and founders to work for a year in a less glamorous office with maybe less good coffee and build a really awesome product and prove to the market that the thing that they have in their head should exist. I just found when I talked to founders, I had this really interesting kind of aha moment for myself as an investor. Um, I had founders who came into my office and they would pitch me on their ideas and I would tell them, I love you, this is a great idea. You know what you should do? You should go raise 500 to 750 from someone else. You should come back and see me in a year when you've got some traction. And founders kept telling me, where do I go to get this mythical $502 million? <laughs> because five years ago, this was the office I came to to get that money. And now you're telling me you don't do that anymore and I've been up and down Sand Hill Road, I've been up and and around the loop in South Park in San Francisco, Sand Hill Road North. I've been to all of the people who used to write these checks and you're all telling me that you don't do that anymore. And I would tell them, well, you could go create a profile on AngelList or maybe you've got a rich uncle or maybe you could go you know, meet with 40 angels and get 10 yeses and maybe you get there that way. And what I realized is that the need for early stage capital for that first check that helps you go from I'm quitting my job and I've got my spouse's support and belief in my dream that's sort of paying the bills to the point where you can hire people. The need for that has not gone away. It's just that all the people who used to write that check have graduated. And they've graduated because they were successful. 
And so what I wanted to do is I said, I really want to be in the long-term business of writing first checks to entrepreneurs. I want to fill the void that all of my colleagues have left because I know that it's driving founders crazy trying to figure out how do I get the capital I need to finish this prototype and hire the two engineers I need to make this product a reality. So that's what I decided to do. I had a really good, like every entrepreneur, I had a really good, interesting job at SoftTech, and I looked at where the firm was going. I said, I think my colleagues will be really successful writing bigger checks to, small, to fewer companies. I want to go the opposite direction. I want to go <laughs> seek risk. I want to find companies where the odds of success are lower, but where the payoff for being successful is higher, and where I can be kind of the first VC, that first person who sponsors their dream, who writes them a 100 or 250K check that enables them to get started. Now, the funny thing is, there should be no such thing as pre-seed. It's kind of a nonsensical term if you think about it. Like, what is a pre-seed? I don't even know. Here's what I do know. Seed today is not what seed used to be. Seed is now two and a half to three million bucks if you're a SaaS company, we're probably talking ten to $25,000 in MRR already to get to a seed round. If you're a consumer company, we're probably talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of daily active users, months worth of cohort data. We're talking about companies that have proven something. They might not have proven that they're you know, IPO scale, huge companies, but they've proven that there's some demand for what they want to do. I think of what I'm doing as seed investing. I think that is something different. Those guys should change the name of what they do. They should let me be the seed guy. But that's not going to happen. So we have this thing called pre-seed. And I have to say for entrepreneurs, it must be really frustrating right now trying to raise capital and trying to decode all of this nomenclature between pre-seed, seed, seed extension, seed prime, seed plus. The fundraising market has gotten so fragmented and broken that it's very hard for entrepreneurs to map out who they should go to when. Even accelerator programs I've talked to have gotten more conservative in terms of what they want to see on their intake pipeline. Even accelerator programs now are looking for companies that have more evidence of traction and progress because they're worried about de-risking those companies' ability to raise capital too. So what I really want to do, and I feel like I'm not alone here, there are other people who are doing pre-seed investing. It's the early days. Here's what I think pre-seed capital is really for. Number one, it's for founders who are committed to doing the company that they want to build. You kind of have to have quit your job. It's not, hey, nights and weekend capital, I could go a little bit faster. The kind of people I'm looking to fund, they've already made the decision as founders that this is the thing that they want to work on full time. And they've made some financial sacrifice that's appropriate given their circumstances. So look, if you're not a person of means, maybe quitting your job and giving yourself a month normally, that's a meaningful sacrifice for you. If you're a three-time founder with a bunch of exits, the, the bar for meaningfulness is a little bit higher. So that's one. Two, there are people who have a clear idea for what they can prove with somewhere between 500K and a million dollars. And they have a plan where that 500K to a million dollars will make them last about a year. I don't want companies that are gonna make a million dollars last forever. Good companies need capital to grow. I also don't want companies that are going to make half a million dollars last for a quarter. The goal here is to be capital efficient. And third, I really want companies that have an idea for how this small amount of capital fits into a larger narrative about how they're going to build a really big company in an emerging space. So I think if you're going to do pre seed the other thing is you should be in a space where there are not 10, 12 known competitors today. If you're doing a pre seed company, and your competition slide is three-dimensional and you've got 15 names on the slide, you should probably really rethink whether you've either A, scoped the market properly, or B, whether there's a real opportunity for what you're doing. So the kind of things I've been looking for at Pre-Seed, there are spaces where most VCs today fear to tread. So I've done things in robotics. I've done some things in healthcare. I think I've not done as much in software as a service because I think there's plenty of capital available there. So the one thing I want to do is I wanted to leave about 10 minutes for questions just to ask if you, in the event that folks had questions about the current fundraising environment. Because the thing I will say is, you know, fear and greed are these sort of two ends of the same pendulum. I think for a long period of time, the world is really oriented towards greed. 
people were afraid of missing out on hot companies. Investors were happy to pay top dollar to win what they thought were the hottest opportunities. Valuations got pretty high. Things got a little bit crazy. I think the pendulum is really swung back hard the other way. I think with what's happening in the public markets, a lot of investors have gotten more conservative. They want to, they want to see more in order to get to yes, and they're willing to miss out. They're willing to let something that feels hot and exciting pass if they don't have enough time to fully run their process, if they can't get comfortable with the market dynamics. And so I think as founders, that's something you need to be aware of. But I know that fundraising is a crazy dynamic topic, and I wanted to give you a sense of what I think pre-seed is really here to fill. It's to fill that gap that seed used to fill. And I wanted to also just open it up to questions. I can talk about pre-seed all day, but I'm sure some of you have questions about the fundraising market in general, or as it pertains to your specific company. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Adrian Gillette, and um, I moved away from Silicon Valley two years ago, moved to uh, Phoenix uh, because of the financial hardships. Uh -huh. Very, very expensive over here. My question to you is, somebody that's based in Phoenix, that's not based in Silicon Valley, that's working on a startup idea, that need, is looking for pre-seed, you know, what, what, what suggestions uh, do you have uh, for, for people that are outside of Silicon Valley to try to attract uh, VCs that are based in Silicon Valley. I won't dis I, I won't lie to you. It will be hard. Um, there's a lot of VCs who firmly believe that they want to invest in their own backyard. I invest in four core geographic markets: San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Waterloo, Ontario, slash Toronto, New York, and a little bit of Los Angeles. Those are the four because those are the places where I feel like I can build enough density in my portfolio that the companies can help each other locally, and that there's enough good advisors in those areas to give them help. My biggest fear when I invest outside of a major metro is when you have a question on Friday afternoon and I can't be there, I'm always like, well, who's going to answer that question? And is that person going to give that founder the kind of advice that I think is appropriate for what they're trying to build? And I find in some markets outside of the core ones that I focus on, you don't have that depth of both engineering talent, sales and marketing talent, and kind of advisory talent. So I, I think you should go in knowing it's going to be hard, but there are folks who will invest in in those areas. Great, uh, thanks. So uh, I'm wondering, what kind of startups do you, do you invest in? And also, uh, if you have an example of a cool startup you've uh, been looking at lately. <laughs> yeah, so what kind of startups do I invest in? I am a generalist, so I would say broadly there's two kinds of VC firms out there. There's ones that have deep expertise in one vertical, big data, e-commerce, consumer, and there's generalists. So of the first 15 investments I've made, two are hardware, 13 are software. And it's about an even split between B2B and B2C software. The unfortunate thing about being a pre-seed investor is I only have one company that's publicly announced what they're doing. I only have six of the 15 that have websites. So I can tell you an area where I'm really interested in. I'm really interested in robotics. So I've made one investment in robotics already. I'm looking at a second one. I'm trying to find areas where nobody knows anything about how it's going to play out yet. And so that by being smart and aggressive, I can get in early. Is there a way that VCs can help people who need visas to work on their ideas? Because I'm in a scenario where I have to stay at my yeah. work to stay in the country, yep. and I can't work on my idea at the same mm -hmm. time. I, so the question is about visas. Is there a way for VCs to help with visas? I would really encourage you to check out the Unshackled program. There's a, there's a firm down in Palo Alto that's, that's working on this. Yeah, they, they close their, uh, their date close for theirs. For the cycle? Yeah. Is there a way that like, VCs can help entrepreneurs in this scenario? <laughs> Um, I can say I've written visa support letters for portfolio companies that wanted to sponsor visas. I've never, I don't know many VC firms that can actually do much to help sponsor individuals just because in general those folks don't work for the VC firms. You wouldn't take like an entrepreneur in residence, for example, just to give them time to work on their idea? It isn't something I've done, but I bet you there's probably firms out there thinking about it. Okay, thanks. Yep. I have a question for probably most of us have, yeah. who've already made that sacrifice yeah. and already quit our job and looking for the capital in between having a really great product that's going to take off and where we are with the embarrassing prototype that we yeah. have today. How do we apply and where do we find more VCs like you who are interested in the pre-seed phase? Yeah, so uh, I also don't really have a website yet. Embarrassed to say. <laughs> that would kind of help. <laughs> my, my designers are working on it, I promise. I'm just Charles at Precursor VC. I'm like pretty easy to find. Um, I actually do respond to almost every cold pitch or email I get so long as it's well written and well worded. 
Um, I think the good news for you all is I know five or six other firms out there that are fundraising for pre-seed strategies. And by the middle to latter portion of this year, there will be a panel at Startup Grind that's called the Pre-Seed VC Landscape, and there'll be six or seven of us up here. Um, there's a couple of firms that have been pretty active. Upside Partnership is one of them. Page Mar, which is Page Mon and Mars Fund down in Palo Alto. Um, there's a handful of folks who've been blogging about pre-seed and writing about it. So the good news is because it's such a new term, uh, most of the interesting results are on the first page. So I would definitely encourage you to look for firms that are actively talking about their pre-seed strategies. The other thing is I get half of my investments, they come from angels. And they come from angels who say, I love this company, they need 500K, I can only put in 25. The round's not gonna happen unless someone like you jumps in and signals to the market that this is a good opportunity. So also work your angels too, and, and work context you have in that, cool. in that frame. Thank you. Cool. I have a question, can you speak specifically about pre-seed for consumer app Ooh. and kind of like what what that looks like do you have to have a product yeah. released or you know yeah. what kind of metrics are expected there so the question is pre-seed for consumer i honestly think um for pre-seed companies to consumer there's not one market there's these two distinct markets there's proven known consumer founder doing his or her second or third company those are like two million dollar rounds on 10 pre. They look like seed rounds, they're just pre-product, pre-launch, and that's just literally VC is afraid that they'll miss out on this person who can catch lightning in a bottle. Then there's the complete other end of the spectrum, which I think is usually, for consumer, there is the expectation you will have some kind of prototype. Even if it's just something that runs locally on your phone, even if it's just something that I have to test out on test flight, my expectation is I'll, you'll have something to show. And then the question is, how much do you have to show? If you're pre-launch, my guess is you're gonna get a valuation that's sub $5 million pre-money and people are probably gonna give you less capital. If you're launched with some early metrics in the barrier, that's probably gonna be more like four to six and you could probably raise, I don't know, 400K to a million bucks. And if you have something that's really going, the problem is consumer companies, they go like this and as soon as they start to work, the valuation has this huge step function. So they're very hard to value as opposed to SaaS companies, which tend to be a little more continuous. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, my name is Alejandro. I started a sports prediction application. Uh -huh. I'm exactly what you described. That's yeah. where I am. Yep. I did a prototype. I've been talking to investors, and the answer has been traction, traction, yep. traction. Yeah. So uh, thank you for that. My question is, uh, how? what's the time frame? How long does it take talking to people to, like you yep. and... Yeah, so the question is like, what's the time frame for getting an investment from someone like me? Uh, the shortest time frame has been a week, but that's someone I've known for a long time. The longest time frame has been six months, and that's someone where I gave them a lot of input on the prototype and the early version, and we kind of met once every two weeks for a pretty long period of time. It was someone I didn't know at all, and I really wanted to get to know him better. And he was kind of fundraising along the way, a little bit here, a little bit there. And I finally got a sense for his work style and work ethic and eventually invested about six months later. So I would say one to two quarters is probably a realistic expectation if you're starting from scratch and don't have prior VC relationships. I'll have to look for you then. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so my question is, how should we think about valuations or should we be thinking about them this early or what are your thoughts on that? So I, would, I just ran the numbers for my investors. Half of the companies that I've invested in at pre-seed stage, I've done convertible notes with a cap. The other half have been priced equity rounds. So for me, it's about 50-50. I can tell you investor expectations are that valuations have come down since Q4 of last year, just given everything that's happening in, in the public markets. So I would say the range of pre-money valuations that I've seen in my fund are two on the low end and 10 on the high end, and they're really different kinds of companies, so that gives you a sense for the band. Um, and the smallest round I've been a part of has been 250K, and the biggest has been 4 million. So. Hi. Uh, as you said, it's kind of a little confusing, this whole pre-seed, seed, series A thing. What sort of revenue targets are you looking at at those different, at those different levels? Yeah, so for me, for pre-seed, I have zero expectation of revenue when I meet you, I've, I've funded some companies that were able to bootstrap their way to revenue early. I really do feel like to be a strong competitor 
at the kind of institutional seed level, we'll say funds that are 75 to 100 million dollars in size, they're looking to take you from 100k in kind of annual revenue to a million, a million five, because they're everyone looks back, everyone looks to the next level. So the seed guys say, okay, to get a Series A, if you're a B2B company, you probably need to be at $100,000 in MRR in order to get the attention. So what do I think is the biggest discount I would take to get you there? So oftentimes they're looking for you to be at 10 to 25,000 in revenue to get you to 100 to 150. For me, my goal is to get you to the point that we know whether you have a real interesting business and sometimes that happens at 5K and sometimes that happens at 50K. For a um, pre-seed conversation, mm -hmm. so for a first conversation with you, what, what key questions do you want us to provide answers to? For me, it's mostly market and people. Um, I'm a big believer that if I can find the right people and that the market is interesting, the reality is like, I'm not, I don't work on your product. I'm not the product manager for the service that you're building. You are. And you're the person who's going to be in there every day talking to customers. So me telling you the button should go here or I don't like that shade, that's not very useful to you. That's meddlesome. Like, that's not what a good VC should do. My job is to figure out, do you have a unique insight on the market, separate and distinct from being first, that's going to give you a long-term advantage relative to the competition? And that's really a philosophical, subjective conversation. And a lot of my past emails end up being, I just don't share your same view on how the market's going to play out. I think your competitors are going to do respond to you differently than you do. I think that this thing is not going to go your way. And then do I think that the people have what it takes? And a lot of what I'm looking for is grit. Being a founder is really, really hard. And so I'm really looking for people that I think have the persistence and grit and unique insight on the market to be successful. And usually they have a deck and maybe a prototype. Hi, Charles. My name is Ashmi. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Okay. My name is Ashmi. I'm a founder, like you described, kind of made the big leap and everything. One of the things I've been struggling with as I um, look at my first um, pre-seed mm -hmm. kind of round is how to compare this with things like, you know, convertible debt that people yeah. raise, angels, you know, you mentioned yeah. you do notes as well mm -hmm. as equ equity, you know, how to think about all these different options. Yeah. Thank so you. so I, I generally prefer priced equity rounds. They're just cleaner and simpler. Everybody knows the price that they're paying for the stock that they're getting. Everybody ends up on the equity side of the ledger. They're a little bit more expensive. The big difference is to do price rounds, you kind of have to have everybody show up at the finish line at the same time. Not every entrepreneur has that luxury. So I'm flexible on notes because I understand that if I were a founder and someone said, I want to give you 50K today, I wouldn't say, hey, give me 30 days to round everybody else up. I would say, give me the 50K. So I'm totally fine with notes so long as they have a cap on them so I have some price protection. And so long as they're generally the standard form, whether it's a safe or a traditional um, just regular old convertible note. I'm not too picky, but there are VCs who are very picky about price rounds versus notes. They will tell you that right up front. Thank you. Cool. I think, I think my clock is telling me I'm out of time. Thank you so much for all the great questions in your time. <laughs>